thank you for joining us today. Let's start with uh, with talking about what's really on everybody's mind and what we're hearing a lot about in the media, which is security in Haiti um, and the status of the proposed security mission led by Kenya. Uh, so unfortunately, things do still seem to be in flux. Um, Reminson, could you give us an update from the ground in Haiti? Thank you, Chris, uh, for this question. And um, unfortunately, the situation in Haiti has not improved. Um, and some of you may recall from our last update that we talked about the um, security mission that was approved by the UN Security uh, Council that would be led by the Kenyan uh, police force. Unfortunately, uh, that security mission was um, stopped by the Kenyan Supreme Court. Right now, the uh, US government, the Kenyan government, and the Haitian government are working on a plan to see if they can resume this operation. Meanwhile, we have seen a huge increase in the um, uh, political instability in Haiti and the security um, of the people. So there's been a lot of manifestations, unfortunately. There's been a lot of um, woodblocks and which basically prevented, you know, kids and children from going to school and um, nurses and doctors from accessing, um, you know, the clinics and the hospital in Haiti. And what we've also seen is, the, as part of this uh, political instability, is the fact that a lot of people are asking for the prime minister, unfortunately, to step down. As you may recall, after the assassination of the president back in 2021, the prime minister who was uh, selected by the president has been acting as an interim prime minister. And people are, were expecting him to step down on February the 7th. And then some of the political opponents were basically calling for him to resign. And because of that, there's been a lot of demonstrations earlier this month and that we basically spent three weeks without any uh, school um, in the major cities in Haiti. And also some of the clinics have been impacted by that. And what we've also seen is because of all of those insecurity and political instabilities that we have more people that are basically without any job right now because as things progress, some organizations shut down the operation and then people basically ended up losing the job. What we've also seen is uh, a surge in, in the increase of the gang violence. And some of the gang members, unfortunately, they are gaining more territories. And they are also taking advantage of that, basically, to impose wood um, barricades on most of the national roads, which basically create a lot of problems. It's basically impacted the farmers, basically, who have the produce that cannot sell those produce um, on the local market, but also with the Mada Sara. Uh, and for some people who may not know what the Mada Sara is, the Mada Sara are what we call the backbone of the local economy in Haiti. They are basically those ladies who basically are risking their lives on top of um, uh, trucks going from point A to B to buy goods so they can go and sell them on major cities. And with the woodblocks and the Mada Sara, are not able to continue the economic you know, um, um, uh, process, but they also cannot be able, they are not able to buy and also sell the product to the local market. So this basically impacted us heavily and it will have, it continue uh, to have an impact on the local economy. Uh, some people might ask, so what do we do as an organization? So I would say that uh, uh, at MFK and one, because we are located in north of, in Cap Haitian, in the north of Haiti, so I think a lot of those are not heavily impacting us, but we have a contingency plan basically where we create um, a local uh, team. Basically, it's a task force with people living nearby the factory. So those um, team members, basically, they are the one who take on the mission to keep the factory running when we have a situation like this, because people who live far away cannot uh, travel uh, to come to the factory, but with this critical team, um, that they are able to, co to continue to come to work and without jeopardizing their safety and security, so they are able to come to work 
keep operation running while we're waiting for the situation to, to resume so that we can continue with the process. So basically, this is what is happening. So we are hoping that we can have everything you know, resume to the normal. But in the meantime, this is what we are doing basically to make sure that we can continue our mission and our and what we do in, in Capetian. Yeah, thanks for that update, Reminson. It is uh it is always amazing just to hear how in the midst of some of these crazy challenges and things that you guys are going through and that are happening throughout the country, how um just one creative and innovative people can be and and what people are still willing to do to to just make sure that the economy stays moving and that people are able to get food things, uh, foodstuffs. So, um, and and really just thank you to you and the team because I know it is it can be really difficult. And so I'm, um, we're all really happy to hear that you guys are staying safe and that you have plans in place. Thank you. Um, next, I want to take a moment uh, and share a brief summary of what we accomplished in 2023. So uh, in the midst of some of the most difficult times in Haiti, uh, and really thanks to all of our supporters and donors, 2023 ended up being a landmark year. So not only did it mark MFK's 20th anniversary, um, the 10th anniversary of our factory in Cap Haitian, um, it was also the year that we installed a massive solar array that's capable of powering our entire factory. Um, and, and as you can imagine, the impact of this is is profound. I mean, just in the last 280 days, the solar array has produced 314 megawatts of clean energy. It's allowed us to reduce our CO2 emissions by over 221 tons. Um, and we've been able to reduce our diesel use by over 19,000 gallons. So this is a, a, a huge accomplishment um, and really makes a, a big difference uh, in the environment there. Um, I also want to, to share that we were able to set production records last year. So in May, uh, we produced treatments for over 15,000 children. Um, and so really it was a visionary decision for us to invest in solar power. And I think at the time we were planning it and uh, putting it into place, we had no idea how much of an impact, we just couldn't have imagined how much of an impact it could have made. Last year, we also, I think another great highlight from 2023 is we were able to distribute our school snack, Vita Mamba, to over 20,000 school children to help prevent malnutrition and anemia. Um, so that's that's 20,000 children receiving a critical nutritional supplement that when they may not have had access to meals at home. Um, and so this makes a huge, huge difference. Um, and really to top it all off, uh, as, we're, as we're looking at 2024, we can see that MFK is, we're well on our way to treating 1 million malnourished children and mothers. And this is a huge milestone for our organization that really is only made possible because of uh, one, the dedication of our team in Haiti and two, the dedication of our many supporters. So um, 2024 is is going to be an exciting year. And I just, I want to thank Reminson and, and everybody for helping to uh, to help journey with us on this year. So um, now I guess rolling into 2024, uh, there's a few things you want to highlight. One is our progress in expanding our agriculture activities. So we, through two large grants and a partnership with the World Food Program and Haitian universities, uh, we will be providing training to more Haitian farmers to help them increase the quantity and the quality of their crops um, so they can really feed their families and make a decent living. So with these partnerships, we're expecting to reach over 300% more farmers than we did last year, which was going to make an incredible impact on food access in Haiti. Um, so as, as you can tell, we're, we've been able to make some giant steps towards moving forward, building resiliency and sustainability in Haiti uh, with the goal really of reaching zero hunger. Um, now, with, with these updates given, I think I want to take a moment here, stop, open the floor for some questions, um, and please feel free to continue to put your questions in the chat, and our moderator, Melissa, will, will share them. So, Melissa? All right. Thank you, Chris, and thank you, Robinson. Um, I've received a couple that have been sent directly to me already. Uh, our first one is... Is MFK currently experiencing any supply chain issues? And if so, how is that being managed? 
Uh, thank you. Thank you, Melissa. And thank you for this question. So um, as any other organization in any other places um, in the world, I think supply chain is, is, is a problem that um, we have to face. And I would say, yes, we are facing some um, supply chain challenges and some of them are due to, you know, the sourcing of the raw materials. Some of some of those challenges are due to maybe um, the process of custom clearance that's basically impacted heavily by the, all of the situation that I mentioned it above. And then some of them may have to do with, uh, you know, um, storage capacity. And uh, I think we have been working on the plan to make sure that we can, you know, uh, get uh, solutions and solve those problems. And so far, we have been, uh, we are in the verge of solving most of those problems. Um, we are basically in the process of negotiating long-term contracts with most of our suppliers to make sure that we can secure supplies and then that they, we can always have the availability of those raw materials. So we are working on that. And one of the major challenges that we face uh, for 2023 and for 2024 that we know that we have to work on is to improve uh, our uh, on the you know custom current processes. And one of the uh, maybe challenge that we, we discovered or issue that we, we discovered earlier was that uh, with the broker that we're working on that we needed to have workers that have the more uh, capacity and that are able to actually work with custom and making sure that they can actually have the process very well defined so we know exactly what is happening. So we uh, late 2023, we started working with new workers where basically we are, you know, improving our relationship and, and partnership with the local uh, um, uh, custom uh, staff in Capation, but also improve you know our partnership with uh customs and workers in port au prince so we are working on that and we are already seeing you know there will be some progress made out of that because of that relationship of the new book workers that we are breaking in and we're also working on you know you know plans to improve and to increase our storage capacity to make sure that we can actually uh produce more but we can also uh in Increase our inventory in terms of raw materials. So, I think those problems are there. Those it's there are uh, true and big challenges, but we are really working on them to make sure that we can solve those problems, so we can continue our mission, you know, to produce and distribute our product to to the end users. I just I was going to say I wanted to add that uh, Rowinson and I were also we were recently invited. Um, to Copenhagen to participate in a big international meeting for our UTF producers. Um, so we were able to, to sit with other producers, discuss the trends, uh, supply chain barriers, challenges um, that people are facing all around the world. Um, so it was, it was really helpful. It was great. We had the opportunity of sharing MFK's recent success with, with solar energy. And we also really had the chance to collaborate and learn, right? To hear to hear from other producers what their challenges are and, and what successes they found as well. So that was a, another great opportunity and has really uh, has helped us think about some of our own challenges differently. Back to you, Melissa. We have our next question that's come in and it's related. Uh, we've heard of a one-stop custom process uh, that was coming into play. Um, can you elaborate on that? And is Cap Haitian still the safest way to get into Haiti? Uh, Raminson, that would probably all be for you. I would start with the second phase of the question. I would say it's a big yes, yes. So um, in Cap Haitian, I, uh, as I stated uh, in the previous update, um, we basically are, although we are isolate from Port-au-Prince, that's true, because we are in the countryside, but it's a good advantage because we have our own international airport and also our own international port. So basically everything that we're receiving when it comes to maybe air shipment or even with the, um, the ocean, uh, they are coming directly to the port or the airport of Capetian. So um, we still have staff uh, coming from the St. Louis office to come to Haiti uh, from time to time. So, of course, 
if there's any problem on the street, so we monitor the situation that we we, very, we are very cautious about having people coming in. But so far, we have not had any issue that I would say that would impact our staff from traveling to and from Capetian. And also having our raw materials coming in so far has been uh, uh, a great thing. So we, yes, with custom clearance, we are basically uh, working on different processes. And as some of you may, may know that we, we have an accord with the Haitian government basically where they allow us to import our goods. So that allow us to do our um, product. And it's basically a process where every year you have to renew uh, the agreement or what we call the franchise. So we are basically working on that to continue working on that. And we are hoping that we can have this as a one time, but so far what we are able to do is basically getting everything coming in, collect our checks of anticipation and making sure that we can continue with the process. I hope with this new worker that we can find new ways of doing it, but this is what we have in place. So Chris, I don't know if you have anything that you wanted to add on that subject, but so far that's what I would say. No, I think the, the only thing I would add is just really, um, another thing that's really stood out is customs has never been easy in, in Haiti. And, but it's been amazing to see the progress. Uh, Reminson and, and Gerald, one of our other key staff in Haiti, has really been able to make um, during the midst of all this to really build those new relationships, to actually invite people uh, from high offices in the Haitian government to come visit our factory, to see what's going on, to see what we're doing in the midst of all of this. Um, and we've really seen that begin to bear fruit. I mean, it's it's winning us relationships because it's when people see this and they, they see the children that are being impacted, um, it really helps them buy, buy into our mission and, and do more to kind of help us succeed. So uh, it's been, it's been really amazing to see you guys accomplish that Reminson. Yeah. Thank you, Chris. Yeah, definitely. I think it's, it's, it's very uh, difficult. And as an organization, because we are an NGO, I think a lot of um, government officials or people working at the high level in those government offices, they are not used to work with organization with a mission like ours. So I think it, it really uh, bring uh, them to our mission when they are able to visit us and see what we do so they can actually immerse in what we are doing and understand what we are doing. So they know it's not just an organization coming and try to make money, but it's just really that we are actually working in supporting the Haitian government and actually contributing in building the local economy and also saving lives of those vulnerable, vulnerable children and, 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 and um, uh, mothers and and people basically that are suffering from uh, food security in Haiti. Excellent, thank you both. And this is kind of a related question uh, to security. How are the roads uh, going from Cap Haitian to other areas, uh, some rural spots like where our clinics are, where our farms are? So uh, I, I, I want to maybe uh, break this into phases. I think I want to focus maybe on the North and Northeast area, and then I can maybe speak generally for uh, the other uh, cities in Haiti. So what we are seeing is, as I stated earlier, um, when there's um, call for demonstrations, manifestations, so it's most of the time it it is nationwide because people are taking advantage of that to you know to block the roads and and making sure that they can paralyze uh, traffic uh, and movement uh, from point A to point B. Um, so what we've seen, especially uh, in the Northeast and maybe part of the North department, so most of the time, everything is calm and safe. But when there's demonstration like that, so what we do, we monitor the situation. So we do have staff who lives um, far away and they, basically keep us informed about the situation of the road. And if there's any problem that we will not put anybody at risk to ask them to come to work. So, and that also would be the same for distribution of goods. And what we do is we look at, and most of the time, the weekends are when they have take a break, 
So if there's an urgent matter for us to do deliveries of goods to a clinic or to an MSPP depot or to one of our partners depot like uh, WFP or um, UNICEF, we will work with them to plan to do the distribution over the weekends, like maybe on Saturdays or, or, or Sundays that even if they are not open, but they can act, actually open the gates, our truckers can travel over the weekend and then get there and then in the, uh, during the week they can unload those trucks. So the issue with gangs, unfortunately, as I said, is a big issue. There, I think there are still some um, part of the metropolitan area that are still controlled by gang violence. So we just have to be cautious about the situation. And of course, when the national police are able, so they would act on those um, peripheral to make sure that they can basically uh, create access to some of those locations. But it's remained a, a, a challenge for everybody, not only for MFK, but for everybody operating in Haiti, that they have to be um, careful and cautious about the situation in Haiti. Thank you. Uh, and you kind of touched on just now our partnership for distribution with World Food Program, UNICEF. Uh, somebody has asked, do we have enough product right now to also supply them for um, international uh, support since we do also export to 17 other countries? Um, <clears throat> I, I will try to answer the first part and then Chris, I will let you to continue with that. So since 2023, um, and I would say since post COVID that we've seen there's an increase of cases of malnutrition and food insecurity in Haiti. Uh, if some of you may, might be aware of that last year, uh, half of the of the Haitian population were basically were in 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 a extreme poverty, and they basically they needed to be uh, to have food. So about six million people were suffering with food insecurity, and because of that, uh, with our partners like um, the World Food Program and UNICEF, especially UNICEF, that we uh, uh, in the past used to export on behalf of UNICEF. So the strategy was that we should focus first on meeting the demand locally. And if there's any excess product, then we could have um, the discussion to ship um, to um, externally. <coughs> Sorry. So, so far, uh, what we've seen is the, the need for local um, demand continue to increase. And the reason is because there's a lot of violence and a lot of people basically are moving to temporary um, uh, places where basically they rely on the government assistance or on other partners' assistance to feed them. So the demand continues to increase as gang violence continues to increase, uh, as gang continues to gain more territories. So, so far, our main focus basically is to focus on meeting the demand locally before we can even go beyond um, the Haiti market. Uh, over to you, Chris, if there's anything yeah. that you'd like to add into this. No, I, I think you I think you pretty much answered it, Ryan. And I mean, the uh, the sad reality is, is that the demand right now in Haiti is so high that we're able to focus all of our production on just meeting that local demand. So it's um, we're, we're thankful to have great partners to collaborate with many small organizations throughout the country. And then, of course, World Food Program, UNICEF, um, but all of our product right now is, is focused in Haiti. So I think we have um, all of our questions that have come in for the day. So Chris, would you mind uh, wrapping us up? Sure. Yeah, well, thank you. Thank you, Melissa. Um, and thanks everyone for joining us today. Uh, thanks for your great support of Meds and Food for Kids. Um, this is definitely, this is, is definitely the worst hunger crisis we've seen in a generation. And we need all the support possible right now to, to keep this generation of children in Haiti um, and the rest of the world alive. So I want to just thank you again for, for coming to this dialogue today. I will um, just stay safe, be well, and we look forward to seeing you at the next briefing. So thank you all. All right. Thank you all and take care.